scrolling over so you all know. How's everyone tonight, this afternoon? Well, thank you. We appreciate uh, everyone coming. Uh, we're a little short-staffed at our table, so I, I may introduce the speaker for you. Uh, he is an absolutely wonderful guy. <laughs> he, he is uh, currently president of the Kenton County Historical Society. His name is Bob Webster, and, and he's happy to be here. And we're back. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to talk, uh, you know, this is, is this is a little odd. They asked for a title of this talk, and I, I just said theaters, because we're, we're talking about the old movie theaters. We're talking about vaudeville. We're talking about uh, the some of the more popular films that uh, you and I went to see back in the day. So we're talking about a, a lot of things that sort of all fall under that theater category. Uh, the, the title of the book that I wrote is called The Balcony is Closed. It's the history of Northern Kentucky's long forgotten neighborhood movie theaters. Uh, I just want to say that this obviously is a, a summary. Uh, we've only got uh, three and a half hours to, to, to uh, talk about this, so uh, we are just going to touch on some of the, the highlights. Um, I mentioned that uh, it's not a complete history of all the theaters. I'm sure I've left a, a couple out. Uh, none that has been brought to my attention yet, uh, knock on wood. And uh, obviously, if you're looking for more specifics about one particular theater, that uh, is something that would require some new research. As uh, most of you know, I'm trying to look at the age group we have. I've got a few younger people out, out there, but uh, most of us remember neighborhood movie theaters were everywhere. Uh, coming to Newport, especially, uh, there were dozens and dozens at one time, and every little neighborhood had one. Uh, they didn't really need to advertise, everyone just knew where they were. Uh, they are all gone now, and we'll talk about that a little bit as well. The, uh, there were no mega complex cinemas that we have today. Uh, you didn't have to drive in a car to get any, uh, to, to any of these, you just walked down the street or rode your bike down the street. Mm -hmm. You typically saw a feature film or sometimes a, a double feature. Uh, you also enjoyed weekly favorites such as uh, Keystone Cops, Our Gang, and The Three Stooges were some of my favorites. I also, at the end of the presentation, want to hear from you all. Uh, I know everyone has a, a favorite uh, story about some of these old theaters that we, we uh, used to have. The adults, uh, although some of them uh, enjoyed the, the cartoons just as much as the kids, uh, they were also uh, entertained, if you will, with the newsreels that uh, were existent from 1929 into the 1960s. You could catch up on what was going on worldwide uh, with respect to politics, news, uh, entertainment. Um, that's uh, where a lot of people got their, their news each week. A place to forget about your daily headaches. Uh, the theaters were also uh, some of the first businesses to have air conditioning. Uh, as I said, they did very little advertising. Everyone just knew where they were. These wonderful movie houses were where you most likely saw your first Walt Disney film. It sounded like rain, but it's supposed to be applause. Just bear with me on that. <laughs> Uh, or had your first romantic date. How many people had their first date going to the movies? Well, of course you did. Or had your first taste of candy. Oh, yeah. And again, those are my favorites. Everyone else has their favorites. <laughs> Hot buttered popcorn. Today's outline, we're going to talk about uh, theaters in the early uh, to late 1800s. We're going to talk about the introduction of moving pictures. And again, the youngsters are going, what? Hey and uh, the heyday of lo the local movie theaters and uh, the, the neighborhood theaters demise. The early history, uh, the very first, that's not good. That's not good, that's not Oh, that's better. Uh, the early histories, um, the very first theaters in this area were live performance venues, stage plays, dramas, uh, vaudeville acts were extremely popular here. Uh, and even prize fights, comedy routines, uh, and light opera. And uh, we'll talk about some of the early theaters in Newport, being Red Man Hall, the Stat 
Music Hall, the Grand Theater. Uh, Covington had the Oddfellows Hall uh, there at Fifth and Madison. Uh, the Covington Theater at the Pavilion, which was an outdoor open air theater, as well as well as the Park Air Dome and the Lyric were among Covington's earliest theaters. Two cl uh, clips from vaudeville acts uh, I have uh, brought with me. Uh, these, of course, were on film, so you'll just have to picture that uh, you're going to uh, a theater for the first time and seeing some of these. Uh, the first is a comedy routine, uh, which by far was the, the favorites in the vaudeville uh, theater, and uh, animal acts were a, a very close second. So uh, here's uh, some of the early vaudeville. If you can't read the title, this is the Realistic Inebriates. Well, Covington and Newport were certainly booming towns then, but Washington, now a part of Maysville, in 1797 gave a theatrical performance, the first west of the Alleghenies. Uh, the early 1800s, uh, Junius Booth, of course the father of John Wilkes Booth, was a regular performer in Maysville, and Maysville, uh, or Washington I should say, was uh, a, a regular stop for these uh, theater groups. Moving pictures. Live entertainment remained popular into the 1920s. Silent films were first introduced in the late 1800s, but single reel technology didn't come along until a few years later. And uh, local theaters began converting to uh, include movie screens. And in 1916 was the first time that a category uh, existed in the local city directories for moving pictures. I don't think there's anyone that uh, is in here that remembers going to a uh, silent film. But at any rate, uh, way before uh, they had uh, the technology for a movie track with, uh, with sound. So they would show you a short clip of the movie and then show you the words. These absolutely amazed the audiences, even without sound. Uh, musical accompaniment soon followed. Uh, most theaters uh, in our area had a, a, just a lone pianist, but uh, some of the more fancy theaters had a small orchestra. Some had uh, people behind the screen uh, implying the sound effects. And uh, of course, the, some theaters, uh, the RKO Alby in Cincinnati, for instance, had a, 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 a full orchestra. And uh, actually, there were people that told me that uh, they visited certain theaters because they had a better piano player than the other theaters. Oh. But uh, I do have also a couple of clips from the early silent movie uh, days, one with no accompaniment at all and one with piano, and what a major difference to have a little bit of music. So we have The Desert Rider from 1923. OK. 
Can everyone see the words or do I need to? Oh, Jack, I'm so glad. So it was a frame up, eh? I think the least said the better. I like how their mouths move a whole lot and then you get three words. Or <laughs> a girl must carry heap to stick to a skunk like you. For her sake, I'm letting you go. Won't you let me explain? No explanation is necessary. Go. I guess the second go isn't necessary. <laughs> of course, the hero always had the white horse, right? Yeah. Today, it's hard to imagine sitting through an hour and a half. But here we go with The Wizard of Oz from 1902. But much better with music, correct? People say they miss the iconic piano accompaniments. Uh, and, and I love this next quote. The Kentucky Post uh, reporters went to see their first talking picture and they're trying to explain to the readers what exactly is going on. They say, you can actually hear the actor's dialogue at the very instant it happens on the screen. <laughs> it's incredible, it's like witchcraft. <laughs> Live performance theaters declined immediately and uh, everyone was uh, moving to movies with sound. Uh, the Jazz Singer is not historically, what's well, historically known as the first movie with sound, but it, it wasn't, but it, it was the first major motion picture, was uh, The Jazz Singer. And we'll have a little clip of it. A lot of people don't realize they actually mixed um, sound with dialogue. It says, Jack Robin will sing Dirty Hands, Dirty Face. They say he's good, we shall see. And this really was incredible if you go back to that, that era and, and you, you've never heard the dialogue before, you've not heard anything coming out of their mouths. Wish me luck, pal, I'll certainly need it. Oh my gosh, I can hear him. It's like we were right there in the same room. to the mid-1930s, an absolute explosion in the popularity of neighborhood movie theaters. Covington would have as many as 25 at one time, and that's when Covington only went to 19th Street. 
Newport had more than a dozen. Uh, there were theaters in Erlinger, Latonia, Ludlow, Dayton, Bellevue, Fort Thomas, Falmouth, Walton, Carrollton, and others, I'm sure. Kent County uh, had the casino. Uh, the Broadway was one of the longer lasting theaters, and uh, the Delby was out in Latonia. Campbell County uh, had the music hall, the Sylvia, uh, which was in Bellevue, the Highland uh, was in Fort Thomas. The state and the Strand, again, long lasting theaters over in Campbell County. Hard to see from the back, but all of those black squares are movie theaters in, in Covington. That's what I said when I was going to research. I would have never imagined that there were that many. Now, they all were not open at the same time, uh, obviously, but uh, from the 1920s to the 1940s, uh, just about every block that you, you, you walk down, you could find a movie theater. Uh, Newport, uh, the same situation there. 1920s, we saw uh, some great movies. The uh, Hal Bella was one. If you notice uh, who produced that was Edison, whoever that is. Kind of sounds familiar. Uh, Charlie Chaplin uh, came along. The 1930s, we saw Frankenstein with Boris Karloff. And Anything Goes with Bing Crosby, Ethel Merman. Advertising posters were in color, but the movies were still in black and white, of course. Color movies or movies with short color segments were around before 1939, but two movies, I was uh, go too far. Two movies kind of changed the uh, movie making world in 1939. We have The Wizard of Oz with Judy Garland and Gone with the Wind. And again, imagine going back to 1939. You've been watching black and white movies for the last 10 or 15 years, and you get to see this. features of the 40s. And then the 50s into the 70s, we saw a major decline in the neighborhood theaters. Uh, they started closing left and right. The Day View, I'll show you a few of the, the more popular theaters in the area. The Day View uh, over in uh, Dayton, 1941 it opened. Uh, the Family Theater on, on uh, Main Street in Covington, 1916. The Kentucky Theater opened in 1939. That's out in uh, the Latonia area of Covington. And the Madison Theater. Yeah, that's probably my favorite too, right? Yeah. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about some of those as we go, go through. The Marianne, recently purchased by the city of Bellevue. The five theaters I just showed you, those buildings still exist and uh, in, in, in other uses right now. And of course, the Highland up in Fort Thomas. The 1950s, we saw James Stewart in Rear Window and Sunset Boulevard. We saw Ben Hur and Singing in the Rain, probably the most popular from that decade. And I can't go by without a little segment of that.
I know back when movies were movies, right? Yes. 1960s, Breakfast at Tiffany's and Bonnie and Clyde. I'm not going to show a clip of Bonnie and Clyde, thanks for asking. <laughs> a, little, a little too violent, plus uh, all the gunshots would scare the other groups next door, so we'll skip that one. By 1970, neighborhood movie theaters were closing rapidly. Two reasons, who wants to guess? <laughs> TV and? VCR. Uh, Urban Flight. Cincinnati, or Covington, Newport, all the people that lived down in the city were moving to the suburbs. There weren't very many theaters out there. There weren't many people driving all the way back from Florence or Erlanger to the movie theaters. But of course the population of television, more channels, shows, movies, right from the comfort of your home, uh, really meant the, the uh, demise of the, no, uh, the neighborhood movie theater. Those away from downtown Newport and Covington remained a little bit longer. Some people uh, remember Erlanger's Gaiety, which became the Village Cinemas. Uh, Bellevue's Marianne stayed around for quite some time. And then, of course, we had drive-in movie theaters that opened up in the meantime. The Dixie Drive-In, the Pike 27, the Florence Drive-In, and the Riverview when it wasn't flooded. <laughs> In 2017, all of these wonderful new movie theaters are gone. Some of the buildings live on, however, we talked about a couple of them. Covington's Madison uh, reopened as a, as a live concert venue, so it's gone full circle, correct? Uh, the Family on Main Street is a, a music, opened as a, as a music store. The Shirley on Holman is now a church. The Dayview is a printing company. Uh, and Bellevue's Marianne may still have some life ahead. The city purchased it, uh, still looking for someone to take it over and, and reopen it as a, as a theater. Gorgeous place. I'm not going to talk about all of these, but again, just as an idea of what we had back in the day, these are a list of Covington theaters. The Air Dome, American Bell, the Broadway we mentioned lasted a long time, became the Hippodrome. Uh, the Casino, the Colonial Theater uh, was a long-lasting theater there. Uh, the Home in the Kentuckian was out uh, uh, on the east side of town. The Liberty, of course, was a very fancy it's the theater at 6th and Madison. And uh, we'll talk about my personal story on the, the Liberty later on. Latonia had the Kentucky, the Grand, the Gaty, the Del Beef. People are amazed. Little Latonia had four theaters at one time. Newport, uh, the Alamo, the state, of course, uh, became the Cinema X, which some of you know, maybe the colonial favorite, Hippodrome, Music Hall, Myrtle, Strand, uh, another long-lasting theater in Newport was the Strand. Dayton Bellevue, the Alcazar, the Avenel, Casino, Princess. The Fort Theater in Fort Thomas, uh, the Four Star Dixie was uh, there in, uh, in Fort Mitchell, didn't last very long, but it was there. And that building still stands. Major renovations, though. Available theaters today, we have the AMC in Newport, 20 screens, 14 screens in Florence, 14 at the Regal Cinemas. Uh, just not the same type of atmosphere whatsoever. And of course, we can't really talk about theaters unless we talk about Hollywood of the Midwest. Um, these are just some of the movies that were filmed, at least partially, in this region. Eight Men Out, Lost in Yonkers, Milk Money. Uh, most people obviously remember Rain Man. Yes. And they're still filming theaters, or movies here, aren't they? Yeah. Just had one finish it up uh, last week. Incredible sidebar story, and again, uh, most local historians had no idea about this till we were researching for this book. But the question is, where was the first moving picture theater in Northern Kentucky? Well, Frank E. Lanius, in 1902, purchased a Lubin moving picture machine in the silent film, The Great Train Robbery. He had a partnership with Ed Beck, playing carnivals and festivals and, and summer fairs all through Kentucky and Indiana. In 1905, he returned to Covington with a brand new Edison exhibition machine. He continued his profession as a house painter, but uh, at nights and on weekends, he opened his home to patrons charging five cents admission. As far as we can tell, this was the first charged admission for a movie theater. Pike Street near Craig, Little Brownstone House, people sat on wooden planks stretched across wooden uh, crates, and uh, the film was shown on a bed sheet hanging on the wall. His son took the money at the door and then took his place behind the sheet where he uh, 
ran special effects with pistols, wood blocks, sandpaper, and other implements. The father ran the movie projector. And uh, Landis operated this theater in his home for about two years before locating to an actual storefront one block to the east. Now that in itself I think is amazing, but that we're not done with the amazing part of that story. That's what I just said. <laughs> Frank Landis is showing his movie theaters in his home. It's 1805, or 1905. There's a businessman from New York City <coughs> who is in Cincinnati expanding his penny arcade business. He hears in his autobiography, he says, I had heard from my manager that a man across the river in Covington, Kentucky had come up with a new idea in entertainment. I went there with him. It was on a Sunday. They walked over the suspension bridge, down Madison Avenue, and up Pike Street. He says, quote, I never got such a thrill in my entire life. The show was given in an old-fashioned brownstone house. A man came to the window and sold the tickets to the children. Then he came to the door to take the tickets. He then locked the door and went and ran the machine. The place was filled to suffocation. He said to his manager, this is the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. The man talked with Frank Lannis the following morning, finished his business in Cincinnati, and then returned to New York. By the following Sunday, he had his own theater. He says, quote, the first day we played, I think we were seven or eight people short of 5,000, and we didn't even advertise. <laughs> Within 10 years, he owned dozens of theaters, but he ran out of new films to show, so he bought Metro Pictures. Soon, he took control of Goldwyn Studios, and he formed what became MGM Studios. So, who was the man who states he never would have entered the movie-making business had it not been for a chance meeting in Covington, Kentucky? It was, well, that's not very nice. It was Marcus Lowe of MGM Studios. And I really think we need a historical marker down there to, to show that. But I found that absolutely amazing. I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to say that uh, those books are available for $10 each. All the proceeds go to the Kent County Historical Society. And I have some here as well as the table out there. But we're not done talking because I want to hear from you all. But uh, one last video you all may remember. And I apologize that you will be humming this the rest of the, the day. Please tell me you remember that. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. We get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby. story about some of these old neighborhood movie theaters and that's what we want to spend the next 10-15 minutes on. I will get you started just because I'm a nice guy. Um, I will tell you uh, my two stories. Uh, one from the uh, the Marianne, which uh, was still around when I was a teenager and I think, uh, I don't even know how I talked her into it, but I had a date with someone way out of my league. I was probably 16 years old and we drove over and I don't even remember what was playing. I was more interested in the fact that I was on a date with Linda. Locked the keys in the car. Had to call mommy. We didn't go out again. And that's, don't like the Marianne very much after that. And then my other story is uh, the Liberty Theater. This was a few years earlier, my older brother and I went to see uh, the Beatles movie, that uh, Help. And we went with one of his best friends, Tony Sanders, and we pulled up in front, we got out of the car, and my brother accidentally slammed the door on Tony's hand. And my brother said, well, Dad can take you back home. And we stayed and went to the movies. <laughs> Uh, I just did whatever my brother wanted to do. I, of course, wanted to stay and, and help Tony, but anyway, that's my, my liberty story. <laughs> who, wants to, who wants to bring something up from their past? Yes, ma'am. I found it interesting that the gaiety uh, in Ellesmere was 
air conditioned. They later found out the reason it was air conditioned it was located next to Doozy Brothers Ice House. Yes, ma'am. And when they didn't deal yeah. with them, they yeah. piped, ran a pipe over across the parking lot into the theater and blew a fan and blew that cool air off the ice. Wow. Uh, wow. Well, yeah, air conditioning was a major feature of these. I remember looking at old advertisements in the newspaper and the state uh, in, in uh, Newport advertised that they were the coldest theater. I don't know how they determined that or you know what, what, how that made a big difference, but if they were five degrees colder in the summer, that's where you went. Thank you so much for sharing that. Who else? Yes, sir. I once saw Dr. Zhivago in the front row of the Gaiety Theater in Irvine, and I don't know if it was the air conditioning or the movie, but it was as cold as I've ever been. <laughs> uh, both probably. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Gaiety out there, they were ingenious in their advertising. I think they actually printed a flyer uh, that they would give patrons, and it was in the entire month. It would show you July. It would show you each movie that was playing. It would have little pictures of the movie stars. So you always you took that home with you. You didn't have to walk down and see the poster hanging up. You always knew what was going to be playing next at the at the Gaiety out there. We have one at our um, museum. Was oh, that right? Yes. There's a small picture of one in, in the book, but I no other theater that I found they had something like that. Yes, ma'am. Are you going to do a video of this? Because it would be really great. Well, it is being recorded, but uh, I don't know where the, where you'll find that in the future, but it is being recorded. I hope we can, because I'd like uh, some, my son to see this, because he would believe it. Oh, great. Well, thank you. Well, yes? Did you find out like when theaters started having Refreshments in the lobby. Uh, I, I. It was a little bit harder to research that. I, I, I actually saw something that after the book came out, saw something on uh, the Food Channel, uh, and don't hold me to this, but uh, how early movie theaters they obviously did not want any. They were used to the live entertainment, the fancy operas. They certainly didn't want you coming in there with popcorn and candy. Uh, but the popcorn vendors used to sit up on the sidewalks outside of the theaters with their little rolling carts and it didn't take long for the, the theater owners to say, hmm, why is that guy making money and I'm not? So bring the, you know, we'll yeah. put it right inside. Yeah, I remember something, that's why I thought they started selling popcorn mm -hmm. outside. Yeah, it was it, it clearly because people were bringing that in as refreshments and they said, well, why, that's just crazy, we'll have our own refreshments stand inside. And of course, the drive-ins, as you recall, Typically, burgers and fries and the whole the whole works, and the the speakers that you hang on the window. And all with it, <laughs> hardly ever worked. You had to get there early enough to change parking places five times to, to get a good speaker. And then the Florence. What made the Florence drive in different than the rest of them? It, it, they had heaters in their heaters in their speakers built in with it. So, yeah. Who else? No? Yes, sir. I recall people talking about Dish Night. What kind of promotions were yeah, that? That was back in the talk For the what? Dish, Dish, Dish Night. Oh. Giveaways. Yeah. The, uh, if we could, could uh, the Liberty uh, in Covington was, um, they give away cars. Uh, so yeah, it was it was always some type of promotion going on at some of these theaters to get you in there. Dish night, you're exactly right. They were always giving something away, but but once a year, the Liberty would give away uh, automobile. So yes, sir. 1950 Kentucky Theater, 25 cents. The Kentucky Theater is the one that still exists uh, in Latonia, yeah. um, and it's it's great to walk walk down there because the the facade still has Kentucky written on it. From, you can see from one direction, not the other. But yeah, 25 cents, 50 cents. I don't know if I remember, you're so much older than me, but, but I certainly remember, you know, 50 cents or a dollar. Uh, I also remember the, you know, stopping at White Castle either before or after, and I, I would swear we could get a pop and, and three or four sandwiches for a dollar. I don't know. Well, what street is that located on in Latonia? In Latonia, it's on Southern, uh, Western, West Southern Avenue, you know where the old firehouse in Latonia, or where the, the ice ball place is, no. Well, Riddy's Corner, Southern Avenue, 
uh, if you, that's the, the direction you would have to be if, if you are at Radius Corner and go west on Southern Avenue, you can still see it. It's a doctor's office now or an office building, but it's, it's interesting to see the, the big Kentucky letters still there. Yes? I'll talk about prices. My memory as a child is 20 cents to get in, 5 cents for a box of dots, and then they were so horrible to raise that to 6 cents. Six cents. Six cents. Highway robbery, I tell you. I'd cut it off right there and go to a different theater. Is what I would yes. Well, this wasn't here because we we're retired here since he grew up in Lexington. But I grew up in Detroit before the riots, <laughs> and uh, it was in the cinema. And I'm sorry to really date myself, but we had to pay a dime. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> and our loss was 15 cents, and so mm -hmm. you know that. That nickel, you, you have to be really wanting to see a movie badly. I see, yeah. So sometimes you just couldn't afford the candy and popcorn. <laughs> wow. Oh, that was Saturday only. Saturday only, okay. Five cartoons. Five cartoons? Five Are you serious? Five cartoons and a movie. Yep, yep. Well, that would worth the extra nickel. I guess so. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thanks again, folks. I really appreciate your attendance and uh, hope you enjoyed the, the program.